Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. Drew Thomas Hendricks, you're on the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. Today's episode is sponsored by Barrels Ahead. The Barrels Ahead, we work with you to implement a one of a kind marketing strategy. One that highlights your authenticity, tells your story, and connects you with your ideal customers. In short, we help wineries and craft beverage producers unlock their story to unleash their revenue. Go to BarrelsAhead.com today to learn more. Today, we have Bianca Harmon joining us again today. She's our, one of our D2C marketing strategists. How's it going, Bianca? It's going good, Drew. I'm excited to uh, talk to Jennifer today and learn about all of the different things Jennifer has going on in the wine industry. Yes, today's guest is Jennifer Freebaron, Vice President in Marketing and Sales at Lassiter Family Winery. Jennifer's marketing and sales strategies have helped build and evolve some really iconic wine brands, including Paul Hobbs, Costa Brown, and Gergich Hills. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. It's really nice to be here, and I look forward to our conversation. Oh, absolutely. I am so stoked. So, Jennifer, you got to tell me, how, how did you get into the industry? Well, it seems like an organic uh, arrival to me, and I think it's common in our business. But, you know, I've been I worked in restaurants from the time I was 16 years old. So there was always a food and wine thing there. And I guess a sales and marketing thing there. And, you know, a lot of stuff that ended up serving me well and some great uh, wine mentors, including Paul Einbund, Mm -hmm. who is a fabulous psalm in the truest sense of the word, and David Rossoff and some other people in this was in Los Angeles. And I was also a performing singer songwriter after college. And so, you know, just a lot of things came together. And and as I uh, thought about what to do next, really wine was the Mm -hmm. thing. And I had a fabulous education at Water Grill Restaurant where Michael Samarusti was chef prior to starting Providence Restaurant. And it was just a great program. So I learned a lot. And through that, I ended up connecting with Paul Hobbs and moving up north from LA with my husband, who's from the Bay Area. And I was lucky that at that time, he was kind of just, uh, he was, he, he'd already gotten started, but I mean, his star was rising and he's a very DIY, extremely mm-hmm. dynamic uh, person. And I wanted my hands in everything and I learned by doing. And so it was just a, it was a good fit there. I got to come in and immediately do a, do a lot. Uh, what, what did you, what, what was the first role at Paul Hobbs? <laughs> I don't remember the title. There were a little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah, it was Paul and his brother and Gary Lip doing sales and some people in accounting. And um, we, the first week I was there, I oversaw some great picks. Mm-hmm. I took Paul to a media dinner with Jim Nelson, who I think is still now the head of Condé Nast, but at that time wanted to write a, an article for Gourmet Magazine about Paul. And we shipped wine and. Uh, you know, I started selling with Gary and soon after I started writing and became the chief writer for the company. So I don't remember how I started. I really don't remember the title, but it just evolved and it was uh, very exciting. And Paul had just launched his first wine, wines from Argentina, from our winery oh, there. Yeah. And so, you know, there was just tons going on. <laughs> oh, for sure. So I, I know. So you started as the writer for the winery. And uh, before that, you were a singer songwriter. Talk to me about the parallels between writing for winery, writing about wine and writing for song. Yeah. So for me, you know, I am a big picture person and I will always think about how the biggest picture and the values and the deepest desires kind of translate into whatever you're doing, whether you're writing a song or having a conversation or trying to find out what a brand means to people and how you can you know, connect in a deeper way with people and, and all the fun stuff that comes along with that from wholesale to DTC to hospitality to, you know, digital. It, it, it's just, I have to see things as all being integrated parts of a whole. And so I say all of that to say that, you know, songwriting at the end of the day is paying attention. I've always just been fascinated. I was lucky to grow up around a lot of my most admired uh, music people mm-hmm. and just everything from the look in their eye to just this 
sense that they were kind of walking down the center of their life and doing this thing that was apparently my thing just attracted me. And it's just a deep paying attention. And when somebody writes something simple that you either would have taken a hundred words to say, or you wouldn't even have thought to notice. And they somehow say it in five words, that just blows my mind. And to be honest, that's sort of the, the inspiration for most of what I do. Um, so that relates to me very directly to a wine brand. It's just tuning into what matters and, um, and also developing the sensibilities about what doesn't belong, you know, what is not important here and what yes. don't I need to say. And that's really critical to a brand. Um, finding your audience is mm -hmm. important. And that does not mean appealing to everyone at all. In fact, it probably means the opposite. And, and especially with smaller, uh, the smaller uh, wineries where I've consulted or worked. Well, the, the old saying is, if you try to please everyone, you please no one. Yeah, yeah, not a not a smart strategy. <laughs> I, I do like this the songwriting because you know the songs elicit emotion, they evoke emotion, they um, bring together commonalities. I mean, people look to songs for so many different things, and I think too often we overlook that in marketing. When we're writing it, we're trying to tell everything at once. And I like that you're, you got to pare it down and you got to figure out the purpose for this, this piece that you're writing here, which is, to me, it seems very similar to songwriting. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Yeah. Is your, um, what advice? So is your, um, you talk about, you got another audience, you mentioned that, but to, to other wineries, to other wine writers out there, what, what advice would you give them as they're trying to kind of finally craft their, um, their copy? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, I think there's a couple things. First of all, you have to think about what is the, the what is the winery all about, even from a structural perspective. Mm -hmm. Is this a winery that was started with a real business vision um, by somebody who wants to reach a certain revenue and margin and you know production size goal, or or is this something that which is common with smaller wineries, especially the ones I've consulted for, somebody started it because they love wine and you're coming in a few years down the line and nobody knows really why they're doing it or what happened or what's going on. And they think they mm -hmm. need to make it and then sell it when marketing is like the thing that generates every sale you ever do, whether you're conscious of it or not. Mm -hmm. Even poor marketing is having an effect on whether you're selling wine or not. A lack of marketing. That is so, so true. The lack of doing it is actually doing there's no way out of it you're either doing mar either way you're doing marketing you can either do it poorly or or well yeah i mean it's influence and we're, it's just like in life we're influencing each other all the time whether we're conscious of it or not so i think there's a lot of questions in there but the main thing first of all is if if, if i'm talking to an individual who's going to be part of a winery and do that job it's kind of like what is the the environment here. Are you kind of on your own? This is so tiny that you just can invent it. You can tune into the winemaker owner and you can say, hey, I think this is what really connects. And this is what I know so far, even though we don't have really much data, but we've got these people that we know on the list. Or, and so you kind of got to start with where are you, mm -hmm. which is always the most challenging, fun, fascinating, but ultimately can be hair raising question where are you? And so if the role is very clear and you're just writing for somebody who already has this vision and that there are other people, lots of other people involved, then you just set about um, looking at other wineries that have this, a similar profile, looking at other wineries that say they have a similar audience, looking at peer wineries who are doing similar, um, whose profiles seem similar in the media or on websites or who are doing events that you aspire to be part of. You know, you just kind of look around for how can you how can you sort of tailor what you're doing to that? And then you get to know the brand better and hopefully you build something and you, and, and, and you, um, you know, you can really develop your own, your own personality. Like you may, you may find things out that are unlike any of those people that you were originally looking at, but that's your starting point. So I think if you have a really specific job, that's how you do it. And if it's this, this other end of the spectrum where it's really small for me, and I even did this with Paul. And actually, I do this because of the way I think. I've done it all the way up to Lasseter's. It's like, who is this person? How is their, how does their life work? Because that's going to influence if I write stuff that's supposed to be true about this winery, mm -hmm. and then it doesn't happen because they're actually not going to be involved, or they're going to want to be involved in a different way than I thought. You know, I've got to really stand behind what I'm saying, who we are, 
And what is the intention we have to connect with people and how, what are we trying to do in this world? So that's a, a big answer, I guess, but. Um, yes, there are some great nuggets in there that kind of, and it, again, I'm kind of kind of playing this songwriting to, to its logical end, but there's like this underlying theme or this underlying kind of um, musical chorus that goes through all the different wineries and, the, um, and you pick that and then you build upon that. You're not like starting from scratch at every single time. It, in your opinion, so for wine, what you love most about wine, what's that underlying theme that kind of needs to relate or be woven into all the messages? The underlying theme, in addition to the idea that you have to see what peop, what your brand means to, uh, to your audience, mm -hmm. it's not what you say it is, it's what they say it is, you know, that's kind of the phrase. So in addition to that always being the thing, um, I think you just need to, um, actually, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Will you ask the question again? Oh, no, I was just saying that kind of that underlying theme in wine. So as you're finding, like you were talking about going towards other wine brands that are very similar, that kind of share the same type of audience, because they all are all sharing that same kind of um, underlying chorus. Mm -hmm. And then they build, they build uniqueness upon that. Um, in your experience for the brands you've worked on, what was the kind of underlying chorus that you built off of? Ah, for, for each brand, like different mm -hmm. things. Yeah, because you got, you know, you've worked with some pretty iconic brands. And the yeah. fact that they stand iconic, they stand alone, but there's also there's some similarities between them. Yeah. Yeah, there are. I think they were trying to do big things. At least Paul Hobbs and Costa Brown were both trying to be do, do big things. And they both uh, were started by people who had a, there was a real there there, you know, mm -hmm. they were really doing it themselves. I mean, I guess that was it, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's Paul, this upstate farm boy, you know, with felt very outside of this community when he arrived here and um, was overwhelmed and just had this incredible trajectory and always worked very hard and was, you know, always in different countries doing different things and just kind of exploring, you know, he'd go to undiscovered regions or re rediscover regions that were unappreciated or, you know, or what have you. And um, Michael and Dan were, you know, two waiters in Sonoma County making their own wine. And mm -hmm. I think so, uh, you know, so they both have this like really, I, I love the word scrappy. It's a huge compliment to me. Mm -hmm. And there's a scrappiness underneath that that I love, you know, because um, it's a lot to build on. So there's just real things that you can build on from there. Absolutely. So talking about scrappy, I hear you've got your own brand coming up while well, I'm flutter. Yes. Um, Talk to me. Talk to me about that launching your brand after helping some of these iconic brands just get to the next level. Yeah. Well, speaking of creativity, you know, I feel like my husband, uh, who's from the Bay Area, came down to LA, and I like to say he got stuck there when he met me. And my musical life was really fun. It was really fun for both of us. And I know we it's treasured and cherished. And my um, musical kind of collaborations and things are an embarrassment of riches. But it was nice to devise our escape from LA. And when we escaped and came up North and I began to work on the wine side of things, um, he went back to finish a college degree that ended up being enology and viticulture and he became a winemaker. And so I felt like I got to really do my thing with music uh, and he's been making wine now for other brands as well. And I just, he really needed, I thought, and wanted to do his own thing. Mm. And so Wow and Flutter came about as our way of doing something together, which is really sweet and, and wonderful. And also him being able to just make a wine that he could say is his and is ours. Oh, and wow. the thing that doesn't matter, but I'll tell you just because we're on uh -huh. this podcast, you know, names are really hard to find. I don't love choosing names. It's not my favorite uh, part of branding. But uh, wow and flutter is actually a musical term and uh, it's an imperfection in analog recording that contributes to the character of the sound. And when we, when the words came out of our mouths one night in a conversation about music, we're like, oh my God, that's just, those flow out of our mouths so great. That, that's just a great name. So there's also a little music thing there, but we don't tout that because that's a, to me, that's a who cares, you know, nobody needs to be bothered with that unless it's interesting to them. Yeah, I was, I was wondering. A lot of people care. And maybe they will care. I, I mean, you see a name like Wow and Flutter and you're like, okay, what does this mean? Where did this come from? <laughs> I mean, I do. Well, maybe it's one of those, if it sparks a curiosity, then that's a good branding piece, right? Then you yeah. can look a little further and you can find out. And go, curiosity ah, cool, another connection. Yeah. Right. So as you're launching this Wow and Flutter brand, um, what, what are some of the challenges that you've kind of overcome? Uh, 
So I think the challenges that hopefully some of which we averted were, um, it, it, you know, how, how much good wine is there out there today? It, it, the proliferation of brands is insane. Mm -hmm. It's such a different time period in so many ways from uh, when I started in this business, which was a really cool time because it was when wine was really becoming uh, um, bigger than beer in the US for the first time, I think in 2005. And there were far fewer brands and there was just a whole different, you know, DTC was a big new thing and direct consumer shipping was a, a big new thing. And, you know, ship compliant was a new thing, you know, so it was a different time and a real heyday and a, and a fabulous um, era to be a part of. Now, there are not only so many brands, but there are, you know, cocktails and shrubs and ciders and everything's just sort of like part Rubs. of the beverage experience. Shrubs, like the... They're not kombucha. They're kind of something that goes into a cocktail, but they're also kind of super homegrown items, uh, beverages. Shrubs. I, that was the first time I heard that word. Yeah. <laughs> they have great ones at the Fern Bar in Sebastopol. Anyway, um, so, you know, it was like, what are we doing this for? We are doing this so that you, my wonderful husband, can have your outlet and we can introduce, like I said, some beautiful little gem. Um, and we have a friend, Mark Lingenfelder, who was the vineyard director at Chalk Hill for 30 years. He's a wonderful guy. And we go see a lot of music together. He's really into jazz and crazy music and stuff. Mm. Uh, and he and his wife have this great home vineyard in a cooler in a cooler pocket of the Russian River Valley where it can be quite warm. Mm. And so a lot of little factors came together time wise and mm. the vintage. Mark was able to give us a little martini clone, which is a, a little bit in a, in a wonderful way, more structured, and a little less aromatic then again, Russian River Pinots can just be really, really big. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of these kind of factors sort of just serendipitously lined up and we said, okay, let's just do it and let's make it so small mm -hmm. that if we decide to do it once, that's fine. And if we decide to keep it going, that's fine too. And I think that was kind of the overall management con concept. You know, people can quickly get into something that's just too big or overwhelming. And I'm not interested in that. You know, I love the thrill of marketing somebody else's wine because there's an infrastructure there and I'm confident that I can take care of it. Um, this was like, hey, we want to, we don't want this to take over our lives to start. We want to do something really, really beautiful and pristine and small. So that was like, I think the best thing that maybe averted some of the challenges and maybe that comes from his experience, certainly working in different kinds of wineries and my experience working with these other brands. You know, I want to touch on something that you said in regards to something that was difficult. And, you know, it's something that I think a lot of wineries are struggling with today is, or not even struggling, but, you know, there are so many wineries out there now, right? When we, when Napa and Sonoma started, it was not like it is now. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think, you know, because I currently I'm, I'm a DTC strategist. I'm trying to help wineries be, stay relevant, become relevant, what do you think these wineries that have been around for so long and think that they're always just going to be this winery and people are always going to know about them or these newer wineries, what do you think the key is for them marketing wise or strategy wise in general to make sure that they stay relevant? This is a fabulous question. Obviously, this is uh, this is critical. So there's a couple things there. First of all, there's, I guess I'd call the nuts and bolts. and whatever you are. So let's take, let's take little wineries um, or let's start with big ones. What are you missing? Because there's so much low hanging fruit. When you go into a well-established brand, it turns out that they really don't have data and there's so much that they could do just to collect that, or they have it, but nobody knows what to do with it. So just fix that one thing. Just see how you can just help them put the glasses on. Who are you currently? What do you currently mean? Um, you know, and just see if you can get some clarity on that. And then, you know, I think the, uh, the other thing that, that may seem to pertain more to smaller brands is the think small, mm -hmm. is specifically, you know, what, and, and I give this exercise sometimes to like really beginning, you know, um, biz, wine business owners. Mm -hmm. It's like, what is it about your life? Just tell me anything. I don't care what it is. You love cats or, you know, I, I, like, it just doesn't matter. Just let's get, get to something real about who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, we can find a way. It's more like, I, I guess I, in general, I'm this way, but it's like, let's find a compass 
um, rather than a map. Mm -hmm. Then we can start to figure out, you know, where are we? Where do we want to go? How do we want to get there? And how do we track our progress, which is really the path? Where mm -hmm. are we? And what do we mean to people? Where do we want to go? How do we get there? And then how do we track what we're, what's happening so that we can actually adjust? So I start with just getting some smidgen of something that's come from them, that they, a little seed that you mm -hmm. can work with, and then stay very, very small and pick a few tactics. The one thing that falls out of eras of very big consolidation, which also it happened in the music business in the 90s and it happened in, in the wine business to a degree in the early 2000s in certain ways, is lovely boutique agencies and, and companies and new kinds of companies fall out of that. And so for instance, there are some ex uh, larger distributor people who have tiny, tiny little boutique, um, I can't really call them distributors, but you know, they will represent your brand because they have the human relationships. The mm -hmm. one thing that's kind of like, where does that belong in the digital world? You still have to have some sway with important buyers if we're talking about a brand that wants to be in restaurants and wants to be wholesale. And so they, there are people who are managing just a few brands now because they're also doing what? They're doing some digital marketing for people over here. And maybe they have a wine club of their own and maybe they're doing podcasts or whatever. Mm -hmm. So think about small, 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 or are there two states that you could go into? One is your home state of Texas because that's where you're from. You know, come up with something sticky and you can do wholesale and direct to consumer there and figure out whether it's just some country clubs or things that you want to do there, or, or whether you want to participate in some food and wine events, or whether you happen to be in the car business and there's some way you can, you know, leverage other lifestyle brands, but just think very, very small and specific if you're small and work with somebody who has a little bit of a big picture um, perspective like this. Otherwise you just get lots of tactics and they don't add up to something. And it, it makes, it breaks my heart. I watch people either spending money or missing the whole marketing piece. And, it, and it's very frustrating. Um, and then for larger companies, I think I'll just use, you know, Costa Brown as an example. Um, that's a big change to go from a brand that is so scarce and so fascinating. I working with that animal of a brand was just incredible. But to go from something that is so scarce that people really do sign up and wait years. And because of that, it's ex very expensive to buy the wine in retail or even at restaurants. And so it's worth waiting. Mm -hmm. And so there's this like perpetuating that. And once you decide that you want to grow, you know, in that scenario, my perspective was do not pretend you're not growing. Mm -hmm. And even a brand like that, to your point, Bianca, it's the older buyers and the older mail list. And, you know, how do we remain relevant with everything changing? It was like, just don't pretend you're not doing it because a lot of people pretend they're not growing and they just try to kind of maintain this veil. And it's like, no, go big with hospitality that you never had before, unless you were a friend of a friend, because as soon as you're no longer quite as scarce, that's going to change um, the, the scenario in wholesale. People will taste the wines more than they have. They'll, they'll become, and it's not a bad thing. It's called growth and change and we all deal with it. So mm -hmm. embrace it, but make your distributors part of that. Make it a win for them. Understand them well enough that you can that you can you know make a proposition that's going to be positive for them, mm -hmm. and go big with hospitality. Don't go small and think you're going to not really you're going to fly under the radar. So sometimes it's like find again find that change. They had some changes they could make because they were so unusual and so scarce. Um, but you got to find some things that you can embrace and just move forward. You know. Yeah, you know, both both of those are golden nuggets and very counterintuitive too many um small you know as you're starting out your tendency is to think big 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 i need to grow 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 and it's so counterintuitive to say you've got to think very granular and on the opposite side of the spectrum like acosta brown who's gotten big their their, their tendency is to keep themselves thinking small 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 allocated 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 when they actually need to go the other direction yeah, absolutely. And to be frank, just because I'm bringing that up, they did. So they've got an incredible hospitality mm -hmm. operation now. And it's like, yes, thank you. You know, because I was actually out in the market um, with this is a separate story, but having somebody say, oh, I hope this brand that I was um, working with doesn't try to pull a 
a such and such. And they used the name of another brand. And they, it was a very respect, respected um, sommelier mm -hmm. just kind of calling that out, saying, don't think you could do this in the shadows. And, and that's that was a helpful comment. And so Costa Brown's done a brilliant job of that, or Duckhorn, I should say, has done a brilliant job of that. Yeah, it's it's, it's tough to... Um... It's tough to kind of preserve scarcity or create a marketing program to artificially preserve scarcity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and speaking of that piece about, you know, so you can create scarcity in a few ways. I mean, there is scarcity if you have some small, small vineyards, right? Mm -hmm. So there'll be a few SKUs that are just like, they really are scarce. It's not a marketing ploy. And these <laughs> yeah. are fun things that you wait for, you know? So there's that. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there's a, 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 you know, at Paul Hobbs, we were really fortunate that the Cross Barn second label brand was very organic and it started with, you know, accidentally in the 2000 vintage when there was just, it was a weird vintage and there was some extra Cabernet, but you know, it, it kind of, that brand of a shard, a Pinot and a Cab came together right as the downturn was happening in 08. And that was just fantastic because people had to find lower priced wines and they had to go beyond what they normally drank. And the, the, the DTC crowd was the opposite. The insulated crowd only wanted the most expensive wines and DTC thrived during that time. Mm -hmm. But in the wholesale market and other stuff, you know, people needed an alternative. So, you know, you could have some wines that are only for the wholesale market. And, you know, there's just other ways you can um, create scarcity or at least, you know, differentiate so that you're still working with a little bit smaller audience than just having all of your wine available to everybody. Sure. Got to ask a question about um, advice that you have going into this next year is kind of all signs are pointing towards, you know, recession, decreased spending, increased prices. Um, there's a, how, what advice do you give, what, what advice would you have to wineries to, for them to recraft their story as they're going into this kind of new, um, new environment? So I know you're asking about recrafting their story. Again, always maybe taking a fresh look at what is really unusual or unique about you beyond the words that are not unique, you know, and, and if you've already done that and you know that you're also really into fine art or you have a specific you know profile to your winery, that's great, but look for what you haven't communicated about what really matters to you. Um, but the other thing is that thing of looking for the low hanging fruit, you know, do you know who your audience is? How well do you know them? What are your touch points? Um, what are their pains? What, what are their pains? Exactly. How can you, how can you just think of them? You know, how can you do something that will, that, that they'll really appreciate and like, can you communicate with them? Not necessarily more, but maybe in a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, what do your communications look like? Can you talk about life or some of your values or other things that you're involved in causes that you support, you know, whatever, just make sure that you're having a fuller conversation with them. Um, because again, you know, whether we think we are or not, even when we're at our most rational, we're still making decisions about what to buy based on what we identify with or what we aspire to or what takes away pain or, or whatever. So, you know, some of that low hanging fruit and just what are you not doing very well? There's always stuff. <laughs> You know, this is the fascinating thing and kind of another, there's always fun pieces. And one of the fun pieces is just like, oh, what's all the stuff that's just so easy to fix that we haven't fixed. And, and there's a lot of that. And sometimes it's structural. Who answers the phone? Does everybody in your organization, however big or small, recognize that the only touch point that person might have is with the accounting person that they, the bank calls, but the bank happens to be a member of your mailing list. And like, that's it. They're not going to talk to anybody else. So is everybody, you know, does, that, does everybody understand that we are, we are all, we are a marketing entity and mm -hmm. you don't have to pretend to be a marketing person. I know that would be like, ah, but you, just, you have to understand that that's what we are in the way that we are all now media companies because mm -hmm. we do our own media. And one thing that a wonderful photographer, Michael Housewright said to me, as we're talking about doing some stuff for Lasseter, he, and I was describing the, the, the essence of this brand, it was like, well, you're a travel company. 
And this is a great way to think. You know, we, we are about wines that are inspired by John and Nancy's travels and even their travel to Sonoma and falling in love with it and buying a home here and raising five grown sons here. And then, oh my God, it just happens that the you know, 50 odd acres next door are available and restoring this old you know, property from you know, a centuries old Zinfandel and field blend and going organic and you know, there's just so much. <laughs> Uh, I love that you, you, you are, a, the wineries are media companies now. They are media companies. They are media. And, and if we're a travel company, the way to think about that is we're transporting people. And, and in some ways, you know, we think of ourselves as wines with both a sense of time and place because mm -hmm. of all the history here, but we're moving forward and we're doing innovative things and we're conservationists with water and there's a lot going on. So we're, we're in a, we're either, we're either transporting some people away and this is what it is. It's this wonderful thing behind me. Um, we're also hopefully bringing them home a little bit to themselves and just relaxing. And then each of the labels is graced with a commissioned piece of artwork that represents the inspiration for the brand, for the label, which is usually one of John and Nancy's little travels someplace. I like that. I, I was thinking more um, philosophically on the travel company because like opening a bottle of wine and the aromas and everything, it can take you to another place instantly. So whether, I mean, or not, whether or not they're going to the winery, you're taking them on a journey when you're opening the bottle. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And that's what's so great about wine. I mean, other than sound, you know, sensory taste and smell is just, as we all know, it's so evocative. The crayons from your, you know, room when you were a kid, like just anything can just, it can just take you back or take you anywhere or take you back to Barolo where you can't wait to go back um, and haven't been in a while. <laughs> I, I was talking, oh, I love Barolo. We were supposed to go this year. I, we, my wife and I had a trip planned to Piedmont. It was gonna be fantastic, but we ended up redoing our house. So next year. <laughs> okay, well, that's a good compromise. But yeah, that, that, that was my travel plans that got foiled by a wall that fell down. But you'll get there get there <laughs> that's another story talking about sounds and the whole evocative nature of the bottle i remember last year i was talking with dr hobie wedler who's blind and is talking and really does these studies on all the other senses besides the look of the wine and the color of the wine and all the prejudices that the color of the wine can give and one of the things we talked about was the little unknown is the sound like the the sound of the screw cap opening or the sound of the cork being pulled it's they both have two very different evocative um, feelings. One might be the best sound you hear at a barbecue. The other one is something at a fine dining restaurant. And this is my weird segue into corks and sustainability. <laughs> <laughs> now we had yeah. talked in the pre-show about sustainability and corks. And for me, there's nothing, there's no more happy sound than the sound of a cork being popped. And as we were talking earlier, it's, it's one of the more sustainable um, parts of the of the winemaking process yeah it, it is uh and this is such a big subject i i it would be fun to do another whole podcast with a couple of people on here and talk about that but it is really sustainable and you know i'm a learn by doing and an experiential person and i i look at our business and it's so cool how we put wine into different kinds of containers and experimented with stuff. And so, you know, it, it's complicated. I don't want to make it sound like there's one way to, to do things, but it is important as we look for maybe, you know, wine in cans and these other things has really made wine more approachable again and reach allows it to reach more people and we can take it on adventures with us. And so there's all this positive in that. And then I think we kind of step back here and there and say, wait, okay, what are the materials and what is the real impact? Um, as we know, more than ever, everything is connected to everything. And so what is the carbon footprint of the places that produce these various, mm -hmm. you know, um, these various materials that we use in packaging and, you know, cork, cork it is, it is sustainable partly because cork trees are not cut down, which is, I know, a common misconception. So it's renewable. And, um, I think it's just, you know, we've been through a big period of innovation and this is the time to really take a look at all that and see what, what makes the most sense. And it is romantic. I mean, there is nothing like a cork and, and I'm, I'm certainly, I'm a screw, I was, a, you know, screw cap uh, proponent because I also think it's important for people to not be stuck on things. You know, there's different ways to do things and sometimes it's really good to let go of something because there's a, a worthwhile trade-off there. Mm -hmm. uh, 
corks. I mean, screw caps are great for, you know, picnics and taking a bottle, not having to bring a wine opener with you. Hi. Just need to get yeah. that open. I've, I've already had too many bottles of wine. Let's go for the screw cap. because. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the thing. If we did it one way, really, it's that's not the point. It's mm-hmm. just to, to be conscious of how these various choices and options. And look, if we start to analyze our lives, I mean, you could easily go crazy in about five seconds because we're all consuming all kinds of stuff. So anytime we could, again, just focus in on something and take mm-hmm. a look at that, I think is a positive. I agree. <laughs> and the... Um... So with Wow and Flutter, I want to get back to that a little bit. So is this your first vintage, the 2019? It is. Yeah, it's really exciting. So we did it really small and, you know, we just launched it, you know, social media style and, and simple and people reached out. It was great. And uh, it's it's sold out from the winery, which is really fun. And um, it's with a, a broker down south, Free Run who is doing so it's in some restaurants and things down in South in Southern Cal and we're, we're almost through it and we'll be releasing another one next spring. Oh, well, that's fantastic. And I love the label who came up with the artwork. Uh, great. Well, so my uncle Rod is an architect in San Francisco and he's also a great champion of all creative things and people and, and generations now of people in our family. He's a, uh, he's, he's, he's incredible. So we had a vague notion of nothing literal, no vineyards, no grapes, ah, but maybe vaguely a landscape and vaguely a sound wave. And, you know, I don't know, but not cheesy. Um, and so I always love to say that I'm not a graphics person. I mean, I've had to build, I built our own website. You know, I, I do things cause I'm scrappy, but, um, but I've worked with Chuck House most of my career. So I don't have to do much in the way of label creation. And so we gave that to him and he did some drawings and that was really kind of him and they were beautiful. And then out of the blue, he engaged his friend, Thomas Ingemeyer, who you can look up, Ingemeyer, I-N-G-M-I-R-E. And he's a calligrapher, but that's an understatement. He really takes that to a whole level that's out of this world. And that's what he came back with. And we just took a look at it and said, yep. (laughs) I I have to say, I love it because you do see the hills of it's evocative of the hills of the area, but that the way the wow is, you definitely get the sound wave, but it doesn't look so literal like you're um, just took a sound wave and made it look like <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cool. Um, yeah, he did. He did a great job, and you know, it's it's tough always. I mean, I for my whole career, it's this thing of do you do a different color? Do mm-hmm. you stay with something that's more black and white and classic mm-hmm. and I mean, I had no idea where that would end up, but that that label kind of took care of that for us as well. And we'll, I'm sure we'll enhance it or keep evolving it each time, but um, but it kind of took care of the whole shebang for us. It was beautiful and we thought it was impactful. It was uh, not taking itself too seriously, which was part of the point. And yet we thought that it was really a great, you know, a great label. Absolutely. You talked about the launching it with the social media blitz. Talk to me about that. How does it, how how does a, a brand new upstart winery go about doing that? <laughs> well, this is so funny. This is a this is just really about having a long career mm-hmm. in restaurants and now in the wine business. It's been a long time, mm-hmm. and so I, I I I would be lying if I said I did this great strategic thing for our particular brand. Um, We put the word out and we shared it. And Mm -hmm. thankfully we had enough people who knew us or then people who introduced it to somebody else that we were able to do that and and have it work. And then I've been involved with some, you know, wonderful um, wine events over the years. And so there were people who were really interested in our brand and the Lassiters are so generous. You know, we, 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 we re-entered the world of, of events, which I hadn't been in for all during COVID yeah. by going to the High Museum Atlanta Wine Auction with Lasseter. And I have a huge history with that event. It's a really successful one for, for me personally and for the brands that I've worked with. And I have so many great friends there. And so the Lasseters are very generous and we're like, well, they, and I said they, they would like me to show Wow and Flutter as well if we're going to take uh, Lasseter there and introduce them. And they were, they were totally enthusiastic about that, which is just that's the stuff that's really, really wonderful. So it got a little bit of a spotlight there too. What a fantastic opportunity. That's yeah, cool. I mean, really great. Like I'm so appreciative. That's just the kind of stuff that's golden. 
Yeah, that and also, I mean, having the history, I mean, for you, you're just executing what you, what you do. But for what about a winery or a winemaker that's trying to launch his brand that has been resistant to be on social his whole life or her whole life and now needs to use it? <laughs> that's the tough, that's the million dollar question there. <laughs> yeah, this is tough because here's where it's all about who would you have do this for you because it's difficult to delegate and to have it go well. But if you're really, I mean, I know a lot of winemakers who are just not, this is, that is not their thing. Mm -hmm. um, some that are, I can think of who are really successful for a long time and some who are a little bit newer. And if it's just really not your thing, you're gonna have to find a quality person, usually through word of mouth. There's some other small wine winery or winemaker you know, who's got somebody who is willing to do this and can do it well enough to represent you and, and just get that person to do it. I mean, if you're, if you're, if it's a choice between, you're just not going to do it, mm -hmm. <laughs> get real and, and then work with somebody very closely. You are going to have to craft your story. You are going to have to do some exercises to come up with the kinds of words, the kinds of language um, and things that are acceptable to you. And it doesn't have to be perfect. That's the other thing and get going um, and to develop a certain, a, a style and, you know, and that kind of thing and a website that makes sense, which thank God those are so simple these days. I mean, it's, these things don't have to be complicated. Um, but I think if, if it's really not your thing, you, you've got to find somebody to do it for yeah, you. Yeah, you have to. So is, do you think it's possible to launch a wine brand and not use social media today? So because some of the coolest stories are always the person who did it, then it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And I've worked for some of those people. It's just the best oh. stuff. Like it just doesn't make sense. Don't don't advise. Don't do this at home. Um, I'm sure, or I would say it's definitely possible. There's no way that it's advisable because mm -hmm. we. This is how we communicate with each other, and even more so um, because we're in a phase with the wine business where there isn't one critic or one. Mm -hmm anything mm -hmm. that can make your brand which was the case in the past yeah you can't it just get into rubber hands and pray for a 98 point score yeah it, it it doesn't do that and so really the way we we uh, build something is through influence and mm -hmm. peer marketing and so there you just you got to connect with more people and connect with people who will be happy to spread the word and share your brand. So that could be a strategy. You probably know some people if you're not somebody who's on social media, you know, maybe you'll have to do it. Maybe you have to learn to do it. You know, you, you figure out, look, I'm going to just take these kinds of photos and I'm just going to say these kinds of things. And this is who I am and, you know, forget it. But you probably know other people who would be so happy to champion your brand. I have a great time marketing other people's stuff, partly because it's not my thing. And I think we, many people feel that way. So you have some friends or somebody who'd be willing to do some of that and, and help you spread the word, I'm, I'm sure. I like how you said peer marketing, because a lot of people think social media, then they immediately just go to Instagram, Facebook, and the big, and they're like, that's, me, that's not me. But they don't realize that they are doing peer marketing, because just a random example, it may be a firefighter that wants to start a winery who's got this huge network of fellow firefighters and this huge network. And he doesn't even realize that he is on the forums and he's actually marketing through a social network. It just may be the firefighter network and not the, the Instagram. Absolutely, yep. There you go, I just gotta open up these definitions and you know, find new, <laughs> find new ways. But yeah, that's, that's, a great, that's a great point. I wanna start using peer marketing. I may borrow that. <laughs> Go for it. Thank you. <laughs> Jennifer, it's kind of we're wrapping down here. I gotta, I'm gonna ask another question out of the blue because I know you're your affinity to jazz. I'm our collection. What jazz album should I get? Oh my god, the most impossible question ever. <laughs> I'm first I'm thing that came to your head. If you're I'm instantly if paralyzed. Is, if the <laughs> If your collection um, was burning and you had to grab one, which would you grab? So so it's impossible. Which child, <laughs> if you had 40,000, which child would you grab? So it's an impossible question. So I'm not going to get thinking about it. I'm just going to say um, 
Do you know who John Schofield is? No, but I'm going to very shortly. Yeah, check him out. <laughs> yeah. I'll just leave it, it there. <laughs> He's a favorite yeah. guitar player of mine. He's uh, wonderful. Awesome. I'm, I'm going to definitely check that out. <laughs> like, within the industry now, who, who, who would you like to give a shout out to? Oh, my God. Um, I mean, it's funny in our industry. Again, there, I have so many great friends and this is our whole world. You mm -hmm. know, I, I mentioned Paul Enbund earlier and mm -hmm. gosh, he's getting a lot of play in this worldwide uh, presentation of mine. But uh, but he uh, he's somebody that I just would give a shout out to because he is a sommelier in that great um, in that great way of being really humble, super opinionated about what he drinks. I mean, to the ends of the earth. But he certainly taught me a lot by just being so service oriented. You know, he just was really all about the guest mm -hmm. and um, wanting to tune into to what's going to just enchant somebody and give them a great experience. And now he has a restaurant, the Morris, in the city. And he, he's just, um, you know, he's just a gem and one of those people in our in our industry that I'm glad is having an influence on others because he's a really good influence. Absolutely. I got to. Go look at that restaurant. So Jennifer, where can people find out more about you? Wow and Flutter, Lassiter? Yeah. So it's all pretty easy. Um, wowandflutterwinery.com is where we are. And I keep my handles very, very simple. So Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, website, they're all going to be the same. So it's Wow and Flutter Winery. And for me, it's Jennifer Freebaron. There's music, there's a music site, and you can find me, you know, there and Lassiter Family Winery. Awesome. Awesome. We'll get, get, everybody's got to go check that out. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for joining us. Oh, it was really a pleasure. It was a great conversation. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks for what you do. You have a lot of great people on here and the conversations are really uh, interesting. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Have, a, have a great day. All right. You too. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.